I've got my Analog Solutions fuse box and it's an absolutely wonderful sounding synth. I've had it for a few years and just love the thing. And now Analog Solutions have brought out the fuse box X which is a bit of a minor upgrade, although it's got a couple of really big upgrades to it. One being it's got poly mode and the second it's got a sequencer, plus lots of other bits. But before I go into that, I'm gonna change the, the orientation of it. You can either have them vertical or horizontal. So I'm gonna change this into horizontal so I can pick it up better on the camera. And I've not done this before. It's just a matter of taking these seven screws out and flipping it round. So here we go. Well, that was super simple, wasn't it? Only thing I've got missing is a hole for this screw to go in at the top. Uh, and then, of course, all the stuff on the back is a little bit less accessible, but much handier for desktop use, I suppose, especially when I'm using the camera. And let's do that on my original as well. Different sort of screws, these, actually. So this one is the new one, it's flat, and this one is the old one, it's rounded. Very, very minor difference there, but I do actually prefer the new one. I know, sad, isn't it? And you can see again how long those leads are in there, so really a case of simply turning it round. Let's just check that case. Yeah, there's nothing for the top screw to screw into, so I wasn't being daft. Again, super simple. So here they are next to each other and another little superficial difference I've only just noticed is the fact that this has got some writing on the base whereas the, the new one doesn't. Anyway, let's take a look at the front panels. So visually you can see they're very, very similar indeed but there are a couple of nice little updates on the X. I do like these little steel inserts on the patch points. I think they look a little bit classier than they do on the original. Very minor, I know. Then we've got the fact that all the buttons on the original are two-way switches, on or off, or left or right. And we have these red three-way switches. On, on the new one, they are all two-way and black. So it's not just the colour, that is actually the, the functionality of the switches has slightly changed. For example, on this we have an off. On that we have an off, but that's not actually much use, to be honest. So not having it. Isn't, isn't an issue. We can see we've got chunkier knobs on the cut off the resonance and the main volume. A little bit chunkier, just a little bit nicer. I think they look a bit better, but nothing in it really. I'm not gonna swap the, uh, the original for the X for the sake of a few knobs. And to match the all black switches, we've got black M panels as well. And I just think it looks a little bit neater. It looks a little bit nicer. But obviously it's not just the looks, it does have some functionality. So if we go to the, the very left hand side and start to make our way across, the three oscillators, the Master Tune and the LFO, on both of them are identical as far as I can tell. I can't hear any differences. Maybe there's some internal stuff going on. I'm not sure, but to all intents and purposes, they're identical. Then move over to the mixer and we can see here that we've got some obvious differences. And that's the fact that we've got switches on the original and we have to patch something in on the new one. So much handier to have the switches. It's sort of semi-modular, so it all works without any patching, but the new one, you do have to get your patch cables out. So let's kick off. And I'm using Analog Solutions' own LED cables here. Very nice and quite sexy, particularly Instagrammable as well. Anyway, this is coming from the square of Oscillator one into channel one. Let's turn it up. There you go, it's working and it's on. It's a bit more flexible having the patch points, but you do sort of lose an input in a way. On the original, you've got five inputs plus the noise and the sub, and the noise and the sub can be high, low, or off. So you don't get much flexibility on the volume of them, which to be honest, can be a pain. Sometimes you want a little bit of sub and you're getting too much. Sometimes you want more, but not enough. So it's nice that on the new one, you have control of that, but by having control of it, you do lose two inputs effectively because you've got five inputs, which include the noise and the sub, not five inputs plus the noise and the sub. So minor differences, um, not as flexible, much more flexible, but you lose a couple of inputs. So then we move over to the filter, and the filter, as far as I can tell, again, is absolutely identical, except the knobs are different, but the functionality is identical. So then we move down to the MIDI 
control section and we've still got one two three four five six outputs on each one two three four five six but we lose on the new one the midi cc 55 and the midi cc 55 is really handy because you can you can control stuff via your door and just send it out through midi cc 55 so you can put an extra lfo on or whatever you want really but um, midi cc 55 isn't the easiest to output from logic so all the modulators and stuff on logic don't send out 55 so um, it is something i have used and i do use but it's a little bit of a faff via logic but we have lost that capability on the new one but we have got some extra functions here if we look here we've got clock in step one in tuner we've still got the midi clock the gate velocity uh, and note zero and note zero is what we use on the leipzig v3 um, to move from midi note to midi note I'll, I'll explain that a little bit better in a second but if you look at the step one to clock in so put step one that's step one of the sequencer put that into the clock in as it gets the signal you can see actually it's changing the interval generator so if we play the sequencer you can see it's moving through the interval generator and you can't do that on the original. I'll show tuner in a second when I come up to the sequencer section, but note zero is basically where you send note zero, which is I think it's C minus two from your door, it sends a signal and uses that signal to do whatever you want. You can move it through the through the interval generator or use it for the patternator, for example. I think we've got note zero here on the patternator as an input. We don't have that on the original. We've got any old note or off or LFO. On the new version, it's note zero or LFO. And then moving down to the interval generator itself, again, it's slightly different. You can see we've got the nicer knobs on this. On my VFAM, I put bigger knobs on because I'm not a massive fan of these tiny ones that you get, but they do work and they're fine and they've never really bothered me <laughs> before I saw the nice ones uh, on, the, on the new version. But on this one, we have the option of all VCOs changing with the, with the interval generator. So, so this sets the CV for all the oscillators but we also have the option on the original of only changing oscillators one and two, which means oscillator three can almost be a drone, so it sticks at one note, and then via the interval generator, oscillators one and two move through different notes. On this one, we can't do that. All three of them move at the same time or together. It's either off or on. And this is all off or voices one and two only. So there are minor differences, and I think these are things that analog solutions have realized are more useful. For example, more useful to have note zero than CC55. CC55, as I say, a little bit of a faff, and on the, on the Leipzig V3, using note zero is really, really handy. On the interval generator, having VCO3 disconnected from the interval generator, isn't a biggie, you can always do that via CV, and I'll show that using the Artoria um, Keystep Pro in a minute, perhaps. So, uh, yeah, minor differences, but nothing huge. Then we come to the amplifier section, and again, almost identical. The only difference here being is that we don't have the three-way switch, we have a two-way switch, but the CV input overrides it anyway, so it's functionally, it's really the same. Oh, and we've got a different knob as well. <laughs> Moving over to the top right then, we've got an arpeggiator on the original and we've got a sequencer on the new version. We've got a 440Hz tuner on the new one, which we don't have on the original. And massively, we've got a poly mode that we switch in using this section up here, which obviously we don't have on the original. Again, we've got this button here that's got note, nothing or LFO. So for CVN, you put it on zero or nothing, put it in the center position. For this, on the new one, we don't need the additional switch position. So uh, a very, very minor change there. And I'll, I'll show all these in a second. Coming down to the envelopes, no difference whatsoever. Then we've got the LFO retrigger, again, identical. And then coming down to the patternator, which again, I'll demo in a little bit. We've got the three-way switches on the original and just two-way switches on the new version. Uh, and the only thing I can find that I can't do on the new version, which I can do on the old version, is have the two middle notes playing only. So if I try and skip these. Two middle notes on this, I can't get the two middle notes, but I can get every other combination. I can get the first three, the first two, just the first one. I can get the, that one and that one, one and three. I can get one, three, four. I can get two, three, and four, 
but I can't get the two middle ones. And that's not a massive big deal in any way, shape or form, but it is a minor difference. So that's my quick overview. They're the main differences. Let's take a listen to it now and have a little play with them, shall we? So using the Keystep Pro, just going straight with MIDI for now. So MIDI channel one. You set the MIDI channel just by holding the MIDI channel button and playing something on whatever MIDI channel you want to use. So using one for now. Nice, isn't it, already? That's just a single oscillator. Just such a rich, beautiful, warm tone out of these things. Let's add another oscillator. And I'm just doing this to have a bit of fun with it, really, because <laughs> I like it. And also to show the tuning. So let's tune those. They're probably completely out of tune. Let's take the tuner and put that into one of the inputs. Turn that up. Play a note. tracking really nicely. Anyway, really handy that it's got a 440 hertz. Nice little addition. What else have we got up here? Oh yeah, poly mode. Let's change that tone slightly to make it a little bit more paddish. So we're playing two oscillators there. Both playing the same note. Let's put a third one on. Come from oscillator three. Let's just listen to what it's doing. Got it in high mode, or wide mode I should say. Right, three notes. Let's put a sub on as well. Let's take this tuner out. We don't need that anymore. Let's turn it down a bit to clip in a little bit. And now let's put poly mode on. So I'm playing three notes here. I'm obviously playing a mono synth. Put poly mode on. Playing three notes. Bring this back down actually to something more normal. Take the sub off for now actually. Holly, cool. Not quite sure which of the oscillators is going to play which note when you're playing it manually, but when you play it via the door, you can just offset things very slightly, so. So you always get the same notes or the same oscillators playing the same part of the chord, or you can change up if you like, but just offset them slightly to do that. Try something higher. Could 
maybe tune them a little bit better. There's one thing you have to make sure you do when you're doing um, polyphonic sounds because a slight difference in tune that gives you a nice big fat tone on a monosynth on a bass line just sounds wrong <laughs> when you play it on a chord. get more in tune chords. I keep on clipping it, it's so powerful keeping off to knock the volume down. Just tons to explore there. I know it's only three notes polyphonic, but wow. Or paraphonic, depending on how you want to look at it. I really like that, it's cool. Anyway, let's move over to the sequencer. Let's take it out of poly mode. Would be nice if there was an indication of poly mode, maybe if it flashed or something, because not quite sure sometimes. Well, until you play it and you find out. Okay, the sequencer, let's program something in, just put the sequencer on. Now that should be programmed. And it is, but now I've turned it off. I need to program it in again. Take it off the LFO. Otherwise it'll record every time it hits the LFO, which isn't a bad thing actually. You can come up with all sorts of cool stuff, but let's try this. transpose it on the fly. You can always play it backwards as well. And you can change the range to two octaves from one. And that plays the sequencer once and then it plays it up an octave. And you can also program in rests as well. Let's try something like that. Turn it off and on to reset it. got rests. So 
So I think I covered everything there. We've got the tuning, the MIDI channel selection, the sequencer on, putting rests in, backwards and forwards, the range and the poly mode. Um, so let's have a little play with the patinator now because that's what's really cool about this. I'll just turn the sequencer off and we can run the patinator with the LFO. So it's running there and then we put the envelope generators to work or to fire or to trigger from the patinator. And if you've not seen the patinator before, it's really quite cool. You've got CV control of pitch and cutoff using these four knobs, and you can have different combinations of the knobs playing, or you can have different combinations of beats of the knobs playing, so you can have everything playing. Or as you change these, you change the beat of that. And we add the pitch or CV control using these two knobs down here. And you can hear it's all out of tune, it's all completely analog, so you've got to dial in the tune in yourself. So you get slightly out of tune, slightly analog -y style things, unless you really concentrate, because obviously it's a combination of where each of these knobs is and how much pitch control you're putting on via this knob here. And as a play via MIDI, I'm changing the bass note or the, the root note, I suppose. So these are adding to whatever I've sent via MIDI. So MIDI's turned to a CV, then this CV is added to via these knobs and this pitch control. And then I'm just controlling the filter, not the pitch. And that's a really nice way of getting polymetric type stuff where you've got a loop of three and a loop of four and a loop of eight, stuff like that. It just makes really nice movement in a track. and in combination with the sequencer, let's have a little play. Every time I play with these, I come up with something new. So uh, I think that brings me to the end of the sort of demo of the differences. I think I've mentioned everything. As I got the Keystep Pro out, and it's absolutely fantastic for doing stuff like this, you've got four sets of CVs that you can send out. I've got three oscillators here. I've got different gates I can send out. So just makes it really nice and interactive.
So here I've got that bass note is triggering the, the patinator and it's also triggering this envelope up here and this envelope is changing the pitch of oscillator 2, that sync to oscillator 1. Let's listen to oscillator 2 on its own. And you can hear the patinator there is just giving a little bit of a little bit of a throb on the cutoff as it goes from note to note. I've got a couple of little dummy notes in this as well. If you look here, you can see that it's not just on the bar. We've got a couple that are just before the bar as well, giving that little ba bump. And oscillator three is fed via um, track two on this. Let's listen to oscillator three on its own. Hard to get a bad sound out of it. Um, so, my final thoughts. If you know this channel, you know I'm a big fan of analog solution sound. I think they're absolutely spectacular. I've got the fuse box, I've got the Leipzig, and I love them both. They both got different characters, different sounds, but the thing with the fuse box is this patinator, the interval generator, and now the sequence set rather than the arpeggiator. Just the way you can build these really beautiful sounding complex sort of tones or patches that just evolve as you flick a switch here, twist something over there. Trouble is, obviously, you can't, you can't save it, you've got to record it on the fly, but for live jamming, these things are absolutely spectacular. As you saw me just playing around really briefly there with the patinator, switching things in and out. Really nice, really inspirational. Well, I hope that was of some use to somebody somewhere. Uh, if there's anything else that you want me to go through, do let me know. I think I've covered everything I, I, I can here, but I can always miss something. So do let me know and I'll put something else up. Uh, and if you do enjoy the channel, please subscribe, ring the bell, and maybe join me over on my Patreon page. It all helps to support what I do. And, uh, and it's really, really appreciated. I've got hours and hours worth of material there helping you to get the most out of your synth. I've got some samples, some patches, bits and bobs. So hopefully see you over there and I will see you next time.
Bye-bye. <laughs> 